Welcome back for the fourth reason to, uh, for hope. And thank you for joining us uh, during this 24 hours uh, of reality. You know, a very important step toward a truly sustainable energy system is an efficient, smart, and reliable transmission grid that is smart enough to help us be a lot more efficient when we want to reduce demand, unnecessary waste, and save money. The grid of tomorrow needs to be able to support a lot of different energy sources. It needs to be able to withstand the, the pressures of an increasingly unpredictable climate, and it needs to ensure that energy is used sustainably and efficiently. Fortunately, the technology needed to create the grid of tomorrow uh, is already here, and this is our fourth reason for hope. The electricity grid uh, is becoming smarter and more flexible as it evolves. So we talked previously in the first three hours about how renewable electricity is getting cheaper and becoming more available from solar and from wind. We talked about how the old problem of not being able to use efficient and affordable energy storage so that these so-called intermittent sources of electricity, solar and wind, can be used efficiently and in a cost-effective way, that problem is also being solved. This hour, uh, the reason for hope is that the way we transmit electricity from one region to another, from the places where it's generated to the places where it's used, these grid systems are really changing rapidly. And it's about time. You know, the National Academy of Engineering in the United States had a, a big study and a poll of engineers at the very end of the 20th century in 1999, and they decided that the U.S. electricity grid was the number one technological achievement in the U.S. of the 20th century. I don't know if I agree, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but that's what the engineers felt. However, some parts of it are so old and so out of date that it is increasingly unreliable. In fact, power outages in the present grid system have cost to the U.S. economy of up to $100 billion every single year. And it's getting worse. Actually, the power outages are up almost three times just in the last 30 years. And the U.S. ranks ninth among all industrial nations. And of course, every nation has a different story. But if you look at the developing countries, the poor countries of the world, often their grid systems are even in worse shape or actually non-existent. Uh, and in the second hour, we talked about the analogy between the electricity system and the telephone system and how those countries that did not have landline telephones saw the fastest adoption of the mobile cell phone uh, technology and how that same thing is beginning to happen in countries that don't have a grid or have a, a really poor uh, grid in some parts are seeing an even faster pickup uh, of the renewable uh, energy uh, technologies. And there's widespread agreement about what tomorrow's electric grid uh, really is going to look like. Just in the last few years, the scientists and engineers who've been working on this for a long time had a major shift in their thinking when they realized that the rapid cost reduction for solar panels means that a lot of homes and businesses will be off the grid, but even as that takes place, there still will be a smart, strong, high capacity, flexible grid. And it will integrate energy storage into the grid. Uh, it'll co-locate it with the places where the energy is used and in substations, and it'll be a, a, a much better uh, system altogether. Already, we are seeing some new power lines used to transmit large amounts of renewable electricity from places like uh, the Texas Panhandle, where there's a tremendous wind resource, uh, to cities 
uh, that need more electricity. We are also seeing some visionary uh, plans to do large-scale uh, transmission systems. This is a proposal that has been discussed for quite a number of years in Europe and North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, and there is new momentum toward this system. Whether it actually gets built in the near term is uh, doubtful, but over time this will develop. These uh, incredibly uh, uh, windy and sun-drenched areas in the, of North Africa and the Middle East can export renewable electricity uh, across the Mediterranean uh, to Western Europe and south of the Sahara to the fast-growing uh, economies uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. There are other uh, large-scale grid systems in the works. The new Prime Minister of India, uh, Prime Minister uh, Modi, has proposed a high-capacity uh, grid from the sun-drenched uh, areas of western India, Rajasthan, and other areas to the cities uh, that, that need the electricity. But there's a difference between high-capacity new transmission lines and smart grids. When you update the grid, both things are done simultaneously. But the real activity right now is in so-called smart grids that give the users of electricity a lot more flexibility uh, in deciding how they can eliminate wasteful consumption of electricity and bring down the cost of their electric bills. Uh, and when you see the growth region by region around the world and add up what's underway, it's obvious this is a major revolution uh, around the world with the introduction of smart grids. Uh, in South America, for example, Brazil continues to lead the way uh, in Latin America uh, and is going to be spending uh, more than $400 million uh, per, by uh, 2020 and will have installed 30 million smart meters. Smart meters are part of the smart grid. But the big players are China and the United States. China, as in a lot of other areas of renewable uh, energy uh, technology and sustainable technologies, is really uh, taking the lead. They've put this uh, smart grid proposal into their uh, 12th five-year plan. It is uh, a part of their national policy, and they plan to have invested over $600 billion in what they call their strong and smart grid. And in fact, they uh, have already installed 250 million smart meters covering 62% of the households uh, connected to the grid. That's an amazing accomplishment in a short period of time. The United Kingdom uh, plans to have all of its homes using smart meters within just uh, six years. It makes sense. It saves money. It saves energy. It reduces global warming pollution. So this is definitely uh, a reason for hope. Uh, in the United States, we have seen, as in uh, other areas of, of uh, sustainability technology, a rapid growth from 7 million uh, just seven years ago uh, to 50 million smart meters uh, uh, in installed uh, as of uh, this past summer. So this is a, a very exciting trend. And uh, it's uh, not all that fancy, but what it does is incredible. It allows the users of electricity, whether residential or commercial, to save lots of energy and to save lots of money. Now, the use of smart meters and smart grids and renewable energy technology and affordable, efficient energy storage has also led to the rapid growth of something called microgrids. That is not a, a huge grid that's interconnected with every other grid uh, in, on the continent where it's located, but a smaller grid that is self-contained and makes very efficient use of all these new renewable technologies. Rutland, Vermont led the way, the very first U.S. Uh, microgrid project that is powered by nothing but solar uh, using this affordable battery storage. This is uh, a microgrid uh, in India, uh, and 
uh, it is very, very uh, efficient. Island uh, nations uh, and, and islands uh, themselves uh, have long been focused on self-contained grids, but the new technologies that make up these microgrid systems uh, are very impressive. This is uh, an island in uh, Fiji that has the largest privately owned solar farm. They're saving um, $250,000 per year by not buying the diesel that they used to have for their generators. And since the fuel uh, is free, the solar energy is free, it gets cheaper over time. And there is a bank of, of batteries uh, that uh, that are installed along with this. This is a microgrid uh, transmission system in Malaysia. So when you add all of these elements together, and we're gonna add other reasons to hope in the hours uh, just ahead, but let's just take the ones that we've talked about thus far. Solar energy getting very cheap, now very competitive with other sources of energy. Wind energy, in many places already much cheaper than electricity generated by coal. Affordable and efficient a battery and energy storage systems that smooth out the peaks and valleys in solar and wind uh, production. And new, smarter, stronger grid systems with smart meters and microgrids that enable people to make the best use of this incredibly abundant renewable energy. When you put all of these pieces together, the net result is a complete transformation in the electricity production, uh, storage, transmission, uh, and use system all around the world. Now, the benefits are obvious. Not only do people save money, but they also reduce the global warming pollution. They reduce the air pollution and the diseases associated uh, with the, the uh, air pollution that comes from burning coal. They reduce the, the mercury and cadmium and other pollutants that are put into the air and end up in the soil, uh, in the places where plants uh, are grown and food crops uh, are grown. So the benefits are absolutely amazing. But, but of course, I would say that the biggest benefit of all is that when you put all these elements together, it means that we are turning the corner in the battle to solve the climate crisis. I am genuinely hopeful. Uh, somebody did a Facebook uh, question and answer session a little bit uh, earlier during uh, uh, the time between two of these hours and somebody said, is this just a tactic or do you really uh, feel this hope? I, I wanna answer that question for those of you who are uh, taking part in this year's 24 Hours of Reality. Yes, the hope is real. Uh, it, it, it is legitimate. Allow yourself to feel that hope. And stop thinking about the task of solving the climate crisis as this terrible, oppressive, depressing burden. It's not. It's a joy to have a, a challenge for those of us who are alive at this unusual moment uh, in time that we can devote all the energy we have to and feel great that, that we are doing the right thing. I said uh, at, at an earlier hour, when any question is ultimately resolved into a choice between what's right and what's wrong, the outcome is foreordained because we as human beings care about our children, care about our grandchildren, we care about the world in which we live. And when we know that a pattern that's gone on for so many years has now reached the stage where it's creating all these problems and crises and threatening the future for our children and future generations, we know that it's right to do what is necessary to change it. Now, with the new technologies and the new solutions that are available to us, we can solve the crisis. And not only solve it, we can benefit in multiple ways by doing the right thing. And so the hope is real, it is legitimate, 
And th these exciting new developments in the grid systems and uh, smart grids and smart meters add up to yet another reason for hope.